Hey, we are back in for our second logic video. Okay, today we are actually getting to talk about natural deduction. Last time we had our introduction to propositional logic where we learned all about the five symbols and, or, if then, if and only if, and not. And we use these symbols to relate letters or ideas to each other. Okay, well we're going to still see the letters this time, and we're still going to see the symbols, but we're going to now be using them to prove that arguments are valid. So that's what natural deduction is about. Usually we're just going to get an argument, and our objective is to prove that it is a valid argument using the rules of natural deduction. So right now, don't worry if you're not too sure about those symbols. Um, when we learn about the rules of natural deduction, it turns out there are two rules for each symbol. So as we talk about the rules, we're going to get to go back and talk about each symbol individually and learn a little bit more about it so we feel more comfortable using it. Okay, so first off, um, the setup of natural deduction is very specific. You're going to start by getting an argument. That's going to look like this. Okay, here is our first argument. You can see there's three parts to it. Um, we've got three statements. We've got if R, then S, P, and R, and then S. And we've also got a line separating them. Well, what it is is that on the top we've got premises. We've got two of those here. And on the bottom we've got a conclusion. So an argument is kind of like a puzzle. You've got the puzzle pieces and you've got the final product which is the picture on the puzzle. So in this analogy we have a puzzle ding, and each puzzle piece is like a premise. So here's a premise, there's a premise, there's a premise, and when we put them together properly what we get is the final picture there, which is like the conclusion. So the pieces are the premises, and when we get them all put together properly, we've got the conclusion, the final picture. And so there are a number of rules for putting puzzles together that most people understand. First of all, the pieces have to fit together. Here we've got all squares, so that's not a problem. Other rules include like this piece, which is mostly green. You wouldn't go and put it right next to the piece that's mostly yellow because they don't go together. And like that, there are rules for putting premises together properly to get to the conclusion that you want in natural deduction. And it turns out there are 11 rules. There are two rules for each symbol, and then there's another rule that doesn't deal with any specific symbol. So when you're doing a natural deduction problem, what you do is you start out by setting it up. The first thing you need in the setup is a scope line. So there is our argument, and I'm going to rewrite it in a format that we can work with it. Okay? So we're going to start out by drawing ourselves the scope line, and that's how all natural deduction problems are performed. We need a scope line. And what the scope line tells us is that everything right to the right of it is true. So we had our premises, we know they're true. We've got if R, then S, P, and R. And so those are our two premises. And what we're going to do is we're going to put them on a little shelf. Got a shelf for them to sit on. And that's going to be our line one and our line two. And then we've got our conclusion, S, and we're going to put that right here down at the bottom. Now we want to make sure to leave ourselves a lot of space. So as we're reasoning through it, we have plenty of room to get the problem done. And that's why I'm not going to number down here, because I don't know how many lines it's going to take me. It could be a long problem, it could be a short one. just depends on what rules we can use to rearrange the premises so we can get to S, our conclusion. Now, when we're going through the problem, we're going to be using the rules of natural deduction to figure out what to put on each line. And every single rule we use, we're going to have to write that down. So we know exactly where we got every piece of information. It is kind of like writing an essay in English. So like, 
I've got an essay I did here, and as I'm reading through it, I have spots where I use citations to tell whoever's reading it where I got each piece of information. So they can know that everything I write down is true. And then at the end, I put in a word cited. So doing one of these columns is kind of like writing an essay. Over here, you've got the essay, and then on the right, we're going to have our work cited. We're going to say where we got everything. So starting up at the top, those two premises were just given to us when we started the problem. So we don't really know how they're true other than that it just told us they're true. So what we call that is an assumption. We know it's true just because the problem told us it was. Okay? So to the right, we put an A to indicate that that's an assumption. And then as we go down line by line, I'm going to have to write a justification over here to say where I got it, why it's true. And since you don't have the rules yet, I can't show you what that looks like, but as I show you the rules, we'll see how to use the citation properly for each rule. Sometimes what's in the premises is not totally enough for you to get to the conclusion. You might have to do a little bit of exploring to find out sort of what sort of information is hidden in those premises. So like for example, our first premise here says if you have an R, then you get an S. So, I don't know, maybe we want to explore that option. Maybe we want to see what would happen if we just had an R. So, we, what we can do is we can't put it on this scope line because that says it's absolutely true and we don't, we're not sure if it's true yet. We haven't really looked around the problem to see if that's true. So, when you're doing assumptions, you have to draw a separate scope line for it and then you can just put whatever you're assuming in there and then from there reason to see what would happen. And you're going to justify that with another A and make sure the assumption just sits on its own little shelf, on its own little scope line. And as we go down, we're going to need to be citing everything, which line we got it on, how we got it, and there's a couple of rules for where you can get your citations. So right here we've got the scope line. Anything I can write in here have to come from lines that are above it. So as you're reasoning, we're reasoning from the top down. That's our pattern of thought. So whatever we write next has to be justified based on what came before it. Now there's another thing. You have to justify only from lines that are above. And then you can only justify above and to the left. So like down here, S. I can't justify that from something in this separate little scope line because this was stuff we weren't sure about. I can only justify this S by things that come on the main scope line. But right here, say that's line 6, I'm perfectly allowed to justify it by what came before it on line 5 because those two are on the same scope line. Also, I can use anything completely above it. I can use lines 1 and lines 2 for that. Okay. Now that we have seen the basic setup for the problem, that we've got the main scope line, we put the premises on the top, give them a little shelf, call them assumptions, and we put the conclusion on the bottom, give it lots of space. Now we can go on to see what the actual rules are for reasoning through these problems.